the clock is running for the for the panel, but also the clock is running for the the big event tonight, the keynote. I was just uh, I was just on the phone with Tim and told him everything is fine here. <laughs> He's waiting for us. Um, all right, let's restart. Uh, I, I started this whole adventure of the company of the company of the conference in 2012. Um, and if back in the days you would have told me that I'm going to have both Microsoft and IBM one after the other at an Apple conference in 2012, I don't know, I probably the same thing as you, you would have told me like 15 years ago, we're going to be on Intel. Anyways, things happened and uh, we were just chatting before and realizing the whole thing, the glue with between all those companies is called open source. Uh, so I'm super happy that Ayan is with us to represent kind of the little s the, the same thing as the mobile part of uh, 7P is inside the big 7P. They are the the Swift part inside of the big IBM. So let's welcome Ayan with a round of applause. Well, thank you very much for inviting me along to talk about what we're doing inside IBM with Swift. Um, it's great to be here, my first time in Cologne. Um, so just a quick few few bits of background about about me and where I come from so I'm not an iOS person I'm not really a mobile person beyond being a mobile user like everyone is today I'm I'm a back-end person I I come from the Java world um, I, I was one of the authors of the garbage collector inside IBM's Java virtual machine I spent 10 years debugging performance uh, problems and scalability in big back-end systems in banks, financial services, insurance, those kind of things. Um, and now I'm inside this little startup, really, which is called Swift IBM, um, <laughs> where we're, we're, we're doing exciting work around bringing, working in open source to bring Swift to the cloud. Um, you can find me on Twitter and GitHub. You can look me up afterwards. Um, you guys have got a great office here. The terrace is wonderful. Um, that's my office. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty nice. Yeah, we're out in the countryside in the south of England. It's a country house from the 1700s. Um, what, what you can't see is the huge office blocks off to the right. Basically, is a tiny village with, a, with the largest software site in Europe built on the side of it. So that's where I'm from. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is um, the amazing open source journey that Swift is on at the moment. Um, we're only just getting started with it, really. Um, it's less than a year since Swift was open sourced. And I think with the keynote being tonight, it's actually a great time to sort of take stock and see where we've come with Swift and, and, and where we'll be going in the future. Um, then I'm going to talk about bringing Swift to the cloud. What does that, what does that mean? What's IBM doing around that? Um, how you can get started with server-side Swift. So I'll show you some of the basics around that. Um, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit at the end if there's time about what the future holds for, for Swift on Linux specifically, because when you talk about the cloud, you're really talking about Linux. So you, pr you can't read this at the back. Don't worry. I'll explain it. We've got two charts here. We're about 18 months apart. On the left, we've got just after Swift was announced when Tim stood on stage. And on the right, we've got the start of this year. And we've got a whole bunch of programming languages plotted on each chart. And the x-axis here is number of GitHub projects. And the y-axis is number of questions on Stack Overflow. <laughs> OK? So you can think of it as code questions. So up the top right, the things that have been around a long time, Java, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, etc., etc. Swift, there's not much code 18 months ago. But there were a lot of questions, <laughs> right? That's where we were. And this was, this was the buzz, right? When, this is when everyone started to think, this is going to be a big deal. Fast forward 18 months, and you can see that Swift has rapidly climbed up that chart and is starting to approach some of the existing massive languages, like Objective-C up there. Who, I wonder when it will overtake Objective-C. And, and, and what? So uh, obviously, this, some of this is to do with the fact that Apple is undergoing a, a, a technology migration. They're moving people from Objective-C to Swift over time. And so some of that would have happened anyway. But I, I would say not all of it would have happened without open source Swift. 
I think if, if Apple hadn't have made that decision that Swift was going to become an open source project and it was going to be on GitHub, the buzz that there is around Swift in the community wouldn't be as great as it is now. And certainly, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. Um, so Apple put it on swift.org. They didn't put it on apple.com slash something. And they put it on github.com. They didn't put it on opensource.apple.com, where they have historically done some of their open, their open source efforts. So, so that's kind of interesting. This is, this is obviously a brave new world for them. And Chris Latner, the architect of Swift, is obviously a big voice for openness in, inside Apple. Um, but I don't think even just having a separate website or a separate GitHub would have been enough. What has happened is that there's been a really open an inclusive development community that is built in open source around the Swift language. So we're talking about the Swift compiler, we're talking about open source foundation, we're talking about open source libdispatch, XCTest, Swift package manager, all these open source projects which Apple has started on GitHub, which are starting to see more and more contributions from the community. So just a few screenshots that I've, I've grabbed um, two of my own pull requests against the open source projects on the top implementing the JSON serializer inside Foundation for Linux. On the bottom left, some performance work we did. Um, and, and just a few other comments I've, I, that, I, that I picked out of people who are outside Apple contributing to open source. And this is, this is really interesting, and this is open source done right, I would say. And then there's this one on the right here, Android.md. It's kind of amazing that Apple even merged that pull request, right? Yeah? That, it, yeah? I mean, it's not like you can write an Android app in Swift and with a UI and everything, but it shows, it shows a direction of travel and a willingness to work with the community on what the community wants to work on. I don't know if you guys uh, saw, but uh, GitHub themselves have actually noticed this. And if you watch the GitHub conference, GitHub Satellite, earlier this year, they, they devoted a 10 minutes in the keynote of their GitHub conference to what Apple is doing and the community is doing on GitHub and how interesting that is. So they're, they're getting this bit right. Um, another big decision they made was the license. They licensed it under the Apache version 2 license, which is a really trusted, well-known license. They didn't invent their own Apple Swift license, which would have added to the license proliferation, which is a problem in open source sometimes. Um, the license is good because it includes patent licensing requirements, so big companies who have patent portfolios know what they're getting into. Um, and, and the Apache license is trusted by the community and industry as well, so that was a good decision. Um, something else which has been good is the way that Swift has been building on the shoulders of giants. So you, you may know that the Swift compiler itself is built on top of the LLVM compiler infrastructure, which Chris Latner was one of the original architects of. Um, but Swift itself is building on a whole bunch of open source projects as well. Obviously, Git, everything's happening on GitHub. Obviously, well, not Python, a lot of the build system for the Swift compiler is written in Python. LibXML is being used in Open Source Foundation, ICU for Unicode, curl for the networking. Um, uh, the open source implementation of NSURL session uses curl. Um, so s successfully, they're using op existing open source software. And importantly, the code is flowing in two directions. So I said that Swift is built on top of LLVM. Um, contributions are going back up into the upstream LLVM project as well, which is a great thing to see. Um, another thing Apple have set up is the language evolution process. Has anyone been tracking what's been going on for Swift 3 with some of these Swift evolution proposals? A few things, a few people, yeah. Um, if you haven't been keeping an eye on what's coming in Swift 3, you've got a surprise heading your way. <laughs> <laughs> if, 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 you thought, if you thought the migration to Swift 2 was painful, you ain't, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> um, th there's, a, that's, there's a great web page hosted on GitHub, apple.github.io slash Swift evolution where they have a list of all of the um, evolution proposals which are going into Swift 3. There are dozens and dozens of them, most of them source breaking. Um, 
<laughs> Xcode will help you, kind of. Um, <laughs> But, what, but what's interesting is that the actual evolution of the language itself is being done in open source. Um, you can see 144 contributors to that particular project on GitHub. That's just the people who have actually put pull requests in, made commits to that, to, to that repository. On the mailing lists, uh, it's like a fire hose, honestly. That is a, that I think Swift Evolution's over 1,000 emails a month. Um, it's serious stuff. <laughs> so, but it's great to see that there's so much interest from the community and... Uh, and that the, co the community really wants to help shape the future of the language. So how did IBM get started with this? And, uh, I think the, the first time people probably th realized that IBM was even vaguely involved in this was when we launched something called the IBM Swift Sandbox. Show of hands, how many people have been on it, seen it, heard of it? Good. Most of the room, yes. So um, it's an interactive sandbox for exploring Swift. Um, in your browser. Uh, it's got nice features like the ability to save your work, the ability to switch compiler versions. Um, the way it works is that you write your code on the left-hand pane. It's kind of like a playground. Hmm. <laughs> um, you write your code on the left-hand side and then when you save it deploys it to the cloud. It runs inside IBM's cloud, hosted in a Docker container, and then the results of your code come back on the right-hand side. Um, I'll just give you a quick view of it. Who did that? <laughs> Who's tweeted? Every Swift conference, someone's tweeting Taylor Swift. <laughs> so here's the Swift sandbox on the left. So as I said, if you click run, it runs the code and it appears on the right. Um, but that's You've, you've all seen that before. What you might not have seen is that a new feature we've added recently is you can choose the architecture you want to run on. So uh, you can choose between running it on your traditional Intel or Swift on the mainframe. Come on. <laughs> you always wanted your own mainframe. So, so now, yeah, you can have your own tiny slice of a mainframe. Let's see if it works. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, um, IBM has ported the Swift compiler to System 390, to the mainframe architecture. Back to the presentation. So I think most of you have played around with it. Um, there's been more than one and a half million code runs on the sandbox now. Developers seem to really love it. I think more than 100 different countries people are using it in. Um, Germany is the second most popular in Europe after the UK, but maybe after Brexit you guys will be first, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why Swift in the cloud? Why are we even thinking about this? Um, there's, there's, a, there's a few reasons, I think. Um, treat principally the runtime characteristics of Swift. I'll just talk a little bit about why from a performance point of view, Swift is really interesting for the cloud. Um, secondly, for the developer experience, because we know that there's tons of mobile developers out there who are looking for uh, a back end which is as friendly to use as they're used to on the client side. Um, and thirdly, just because it's fun at the moment, right? This is, this is cutting edge stuff. The compiler breaks every week. Who doesn't want to get involved in that? This is a simple micro benchmark. It's called nBody. What it is isn't really massively relevant. It's about calculating the rotation of planets. But it's a, co it's a, co it's a compute bound benchmark, CPU bound. And uh, there's a website called Benchmark Games where people implement the same algorithm in a whole bunch of different languages and they kind of compare the performance. Um, and you can see a whole bunch of languages across the bottom here. On the left, C, C. Um, then we've got a whole cat the category of what people are calling modern native languages, Go, Rust, and Swift. These are compiled languages. Languages which run on top of the JVM, so the, um, by compiled to byte code, but then with a just-in-time compiler, compiling down to native code. And then a whole bunch of scripting languages on the right, things like Ruby, PHP, Python. Um, they all have interpreters. Um, some of them have optimizing compilers of varying uh, levels of completeness and performance. Um, so there you can see this is duration. So how long does the benchmark take to run for each of these languages? Let's compare that to how much memory 
is being used by each of those languages as they run that benchmark. Um, so, C, C++, Go, Swift, Rust, relatively low memory usage as well. JVM-based languages, not looking so smart. Those of you who've worked with the JVM know it, it really likes a big heap, right? You've got to give it some XMX is the, the option. You've got to give it a gig, you've got to give it four gigs, and then it will scream, but it needs the memory. Um, and then scripting languages on the right, which typically either ro roll their own GC or um, some of them aren't even garbage collected. Um, so we looked at duration, we looked at memory. What's really interesting is to look at duration by memory to see, well, who's, who's doing best overall. And if you kind of divide the two axes by each other, you get a picture like this, where again, you can see these modern native languages are pretty much as close as C. The JVM's behind, slightly behind because it does use a lot of memory to deliver the fast performance that, 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 it, that it produces. And then there's a bunch of scripting APIs, um, scripting languages on the right, which don't fare as well in this kind of compute-bound benchmark where an optimizing compiler can really, really give benefits. So this is why Swift is interesting, because it has low numbers down here like this. And, and why is low numbers down here interesting? Because of this, right? Um, pretty much every major cloud provider, whether it's Amazon EC2 or Heroku or IBM's Bluemix, they, they bill you by this, right? <laughs> um, so gigabytes per hour, and the, the amount of memory, amount of RAM that your app's using over a time period is, is money nowadays. And that's why Swift's interesting on the server side. So what does it take to bring Swift to the server? Well, um, to make it compelling on the server, you need to have all the same things as you have on the client side on the server side. Because no one wants to have to rewrite all their code, be told, oh, you can't have foundation on the server side, and oh, you've got to use pthreads instead of libdispatch on the server side. It's got to have the same developer experience on the client and the server side. So wh where IBM has been focusing its work is in open source on delivering some of these core foundational aspects of Swift which people depend on on the client side. So on the client side, people are used to using foundation. Now on Apple's platforms, that's written in Objective-C and Apple hasn't open sourced it. Um, for Linux on the, on, on the server side, we need foundation. And there's an open source project on this in the Swift GitHub, which is all about implementing the foundation APIs in Swift. And IBM's been getting involved in helping out with that. It's not complete yet, but we're getting there. Um, so we're aiming for consistency between these two models. We're aiming that a developer who is familiar with working on the client side will feel, if not at home, like they, they, could, they, could, they could work out what's going on. They could find their way around this new world on the server side. And IBM is not the only person, to, people, to have thought that this is, this is interesting and worth working on. There is a growing server side ecosystem as well. So all of these are web frameworks or back-end type technologies which are written in Swift, uh, open sourced on GitHub, and have active growing communities around them. IBM's one in the middle is called Kitora, which I'm going to talk about today. Um, but I want everyone to be aware that we're not the only game in town here. Um, there's <coughs> some fantastic work going on in other open source communities as well around building uh, the, the next generation of server side on Swift. Uh, and I encourage you all to check them out as well. But obviously, I'm going to talk about our web framework. <laughs> Um, so our re web framework is called Kitora. Um, if you can work out why it's called Kitora, I'll, I'll find you a prize. It's not easy to do, <laughs> but there is a reason. Um, it's an, uh, as you would expect, it's open source web framework, and it runs on both macOS and on Linux. Um, it takes its inspiration from Express for Node.js, which has been one of the most popular web frameworks for Node over the last. 10 years, or well, it's probably not even that old now. Um, 
It has flexible routing, so you can uh, define different URLs and then pass those, have closures which are executed once when those particular routes or URLs are hit. Um, it has the concept of pluggable middlewares, so you can write extra functionality as extensions and then plug that into the application and reuse it across different applications. Um, and it's really easy to deploy as well. So it's all on GitHub and you can go and explore it. Um, so what does, how, do, how does Kotora come together? So there's, there's the web framework itself in the middle, but we, just like Apple did, we did open source Swift, we're reusing a lot of tried and trusted open source projects as well. For C libraries, our multi-threading comes from Grand Central Dispatch. Um, we use the HTTP parser from Node.js. Um, we use curl for outbound network connections, things like that. Um, we, we build on top of um, the existing Swift open source projects, things like Foundation, Swift Package Manager, which is coming in Swift 3. Um, and then we've written some of our own libraries as well, um, which I'll talk a bit about as, as, as we go. So it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is we, we haven't written everything from scratch here. We're building on other people's work as well. Um, and Kitura is, is just one player in this big open source framework. So how do you get started with a Kitura web application? Um, just going to show you, walk you briefly through this. If you've done any back-end web development with something like, I don't know, uh, Ruby on Rails or with uh, Django or, or, or something like that, this will all be very, f feel quite familiar to you. Um, so first of all, we're going to need a new project. So we create a project and change into it. And then we use the Swift Package Manager to create a new empty Swift Package project. Um, so Swift Package Manager is coming in Swift 3. Um, I think it's been most embraced by the server-side Swift community. Uh, pretty much all of the frameworks that I've seen so far are built on top of Swift Package Manager. So this is saying we're going to create a new Swift package, which is going to be an executable one, in other words, not a library. Um, and that gets you a, a layout which looks like this. You get a package.swift, which describes your Swift package. You get some sources and a test directory. Um, Inside your package.swift, you then have to add a dependency on Kitura to say, I'm going to build a Kitura app. Um, so the package.swift file itself is in Swift, as the name suggests. So you declare your dependency and say, I'm interested in this particular version of Kitura. Um, currently, we're working on two-week sprints, roughly. So we increment every two weeks, depending on what we've got done in that time. Um, latest one should be coming out tomorrow, maybe depending on what happens while I'm not in the office. Um, so that's how you add a dependency. Once you've done that, you need a router. A router is what's going to handle the incoming HTTP requests and actually action them. So what this is saying is every time an HTTP get goes to slash hello, we're going to execute this closure, which is going to set status to HTTP 200, which is OK, I think, and then send hello world like that. So simple. We can do JSON as well. So you could say hello.json, and then in that case, you could send back some JSON, um, because this is ideal for writing REST web services. And then finally, you need to add an HTTP server with whatever port you're interested in listening on, and then you need to run the framework. So you've got a pretty simple file there, which has just two simple routes, an HTTP server and Go. All you need to do to build it is to use Swift Package Manager, which does Swift build. And what that will do is, does is pull down all dependencies and build it for you. And then to execute it, all you need to do is execute the executable which is created. And then if you open your browser, you'll be able to hit the two routes we defined. Hello has hello world, hello.json. And then we've got a splash screen as well, which you can disable if you, if you want to. So, how can you get started quickly with Kitura? You can use our sample application, which is called Kitura Sample. That gets you up and running out of the box really quickly. Um, in fact, so quick, I'll risk the demo gods and we'll try, we'll try it now. So, uh, so I'm just going to clone Kitura Sample, which is our project which has everything in there. So this has got the package.swift file that I told you about earlier, and a few other bits and bobs. 
Um, I mentioned earlier that um, there's um, a, some, a sources directory. That's where the, all the you can see the, you can see the main dot swift is. Um, and uh, now I'm in VI. You're all probably wincing, right? <laughs> so um, you're probably most interested to know that uh, Swift Package Manager uh, Swift Package uh, generate Xcode branch. So, what what this is going to do is it's going to clone all the dependencies. So, it's going to clone the main Kitora project, which we're interested in. It's going to clone Kitora Net. That's our HTTP server. So, this is what provides support for HTTP 1.1 at the moment. Um, Kitora Sys is our sort of layer which sits on top of Grand Central Dispatch. We're going to need some logging. We're going to need some sockets um, to actually receive incoming HTTP requests. We're going to use curl, and we're going to need an HTTP parser. Uh, we're going to need to be able to do some JSON. We might want to do some templating. We support a template engine. We need a logger. Uh, we support templating through Mustache, which is a popular templating engine. bit of utilities and I think we should be done. Right, so now that we've done that we can open our Xcode project and I will go to large. So you can see inside here that it's pulled down the source code and you can see our main.swift which has the various kind of default routes defined. So for example here's a, here's a hello route for put requests Here's a hello route for post requests. And what we can do is if we change the target, we can actually run that. So what it's going to do now is it's going to compile all the dependencies for you inside Xcode. Uh, each of those sub-projects that I mentioned is then going to compile the main project as well. And it's complaining that there's an error. Why is it complaining? Oh, no, the error's gone away. Fine. <laughs> Deny. Allow. Um, so that's kind of saying, yes, we're allowing this process to accept incoming HTTP requests. And then if I go back here and I hit localhost 8090, we can hit our splash screen on Kitura as well. And then the various routes which we've got defined there. So you can see, it's, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see how easy it is to just start hacking around with your Mac and having a play with this kind of thing. Um, Obviously, as I said, it works on Linux as well. And if you're interested in trying it out on Linux, which we've got, um, you can download it. It works on Ubuntu. Uh, we've got a Docker image. We've got a Vagrant file. So you can, you can easily experiment with it that way. So, so that's Kitura. But what I've shown you so far is really just kind of hello world. W to do anything real with this, to actually build a real app, one of the things you're going to need is some persistence. You're going to need a back-end, so we've written some back-end drivers. Um, so those of you who like NoSQL will be happy. Um, we've written drivers for Cassandra, Redis, and CouchDB so far. Um, there are um, drivers out there in the community for SQL databases as well. There's a MySQL one and Postgres one. Um, so if you're interested in connecting your app on the back-end to a database of some kind, you're covered that way. Um, we also uh, have added support for authentication as well. So if you want to allow your users in your app to log in, we provide uh, a credentials framework which has plugins for Facebook Auth, Google OAuth, or GitHub login. So you can easily add that to your app. Um, we've been working really hard on performance. Um, because this is so new, right? Everything there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. There's a lot of there's a lot of things which can be fixed quickly. So we've been working really hard to bring performance up to par for what people would expect for a modern web framework. So on Mac OS, we're up to with this is just with a simple hello world kind of hammer the web server as hard as you can. How how fast can it respond? That kind of thing. Um, up to about 80, 90,000 requests per second. Um, we, this is, this is, these are good numbers. This is comparable with something like Node.js. Um, 
the, the, the performance the performance is there. Um, on Linux, the picture is a bit more mixed in that we were screaming along, and then uh, number six there, it all went pear-shaped. <laughs> that wasn't our fault. This is a swift migration in the middle. Um, uh, this is, I don't know if you heard that the, of course you've heard, that Apple is moving a lot of these things from reference types to value types, so like NS data becoming data. Uh, it doesn't seem to be working quite right on Linux from a performance point of view. Uh, it's fine on Mac, fine on Apple's platforms, but we've, we've seen some issues with those migrations on Linux, which we're still gradually recovering the performance from. But a throughput of about 80,000, uh, uh, sorry, throughput here of about uh, 30, 40k per second, those are really good numbers comparable with a Node.js type performance, as I said before. Um, if you want to see complete applications which are already written, one thing you can have a look at is an app called Bluepick, which has been written by our team. So this is an iOS app. Um, it's a photo sharing app. Think kind of Instagram, that kind of thing. Um, it's a fully functional iOS app, which also has a Kitura based backend. So it can um, communicate with Kitura, uh, kind of provides login through Kitura. Um, remember, sort of storing the pictures that you, that you take on your phone, that kind of thing. So it's a full end-to-end -end demo application showing how in one Xcode you can have both a client-side app written obviously in Swift and a server-side app written in Swift. Um, we've also written another demo called of a to-do list application. That there, there's a website called todobackend.com where people um, kind of implement the same to-do list type application in a whole bunch of different web frameworks. Um, we've done one for Kitura as well, so this kind of lets, it's, it's, it, it's, it is what, what you would think it is. It's a to-do list app where you put a whole bunch of things and then tick them off the list and the back end has to kind of remember what's in the list and um, persist that to a database, that kind of thing. So we've written, uh, we've written versions of this for all kinds of different back ends, Cassandra, um, Couch, um, other ones as well. So. You can check that out as well if you're interested. Um, something else we've done is, is, a, is a Mac app called IBM Cloud Tools for Swift. We know that one thing people really want is an easy deployment experience. So they want to be able to develop in Xcode, uh, write their apps, and easily deploy them to the cloud. So this is a, a companion app for Xcode. kind of works alongside your Xcode project. Um, and automates the deployment of your server-side project from Xcode into IBM's cloud, Bluemix. Um, so if you have a Bluemix account, which you can get for free, uh, you can quickly stand up the demo application I showed you on a public URL rather than just on your laptop. So you can use, Kitura, use the Kitura starter repo I showed you, and then Im using the uh, Cloud Tools for Swift app, you can quickly push that up to Bluemix and, and start experimenting on, on a live production site on the internet rather than just on your laptop. So that's kind of cool. Final thing I wanted to mention is the Swift package catalog. Um, so I said earlier that uh, pretty much all of the open source Swift web frameworks have been built on top of Swift package manager. And Swift Package Manager is coming, it's going to be officially kind of generally available um, version one in Swift 3 whenever that's released, um, probably sooner rather than later, I'd suggest now. Um, so Swift Package Catalog is kind of a, a shop front to help you explore and discover Swift packages that are Swift Package Manager compliant. So uh, it's, it's a public website which you can go and visit where you can view and discover all kinds of different Swift packages that are out there. Um, if you've got your own, you can submit them. Um, we've got a, some curation going on of what, what we think are some of the most interesting ones. Um, just like to show you one cool feature that we've added recently, which people were asking for. So here's the Swift Package Manager web page. If I, I'll just try and go full view, full screen. No, no. Did I actually close that? Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> Right, Swift Package Manager. View. Okay, so here's the front page of Swift, of the package catalog. 
you can see we've got some featured packages, most popular packages, uh, some of these web frameworks I mentioned, Vapor, Kitora, that kind of thing. Let's say you're interested in, I don't know, um, JSON. Uh, you can see we've, we're indexing a whole bunch of different JSON implementations in Swift, so you can immediately kind of flick through those and see which is most interesting. The new feature we've added recently is integration with the, uh, with the sandbox that I showed you earlier. So to just show that, we've, we've got a library called Blue Cryptor, which does crypto in Swift. Um, it wraps open SS, um, some of the OpenSSL APIs. Um, so what we've got here on the, link, on the right is links through. So you can view that on GitHub, which would obviously take you through to GitHub. But you can also try it out in the sandbox. So we've written some demo code to show how to use this particular package. And if I jump across to the sandbox, the sandbox will kind of load the demo code for that package. And then I can immediately try it out and see the code on the right hand side. So this is just doing, you can't read at the back, but it's just doing AES encryption and decryption. Um, so if you've got open source projects, open source Swift packages, um, this is a great way to kind of show people how to use them, to publicize them. Um, it's kind of what Ma going back to what Manu was saying about doing better at documentation, providing these interactive experiences to developers to help them understand what you're doing. So that's the Swift package catalog. Uh, exit full screen. So final thing is just to talk a bit about the future. Um, what the future holds for Kitora? Well, I've put question mark because we don't make forward thinking statements. We don't say what we're going to do, but. And in fact, I'm kind of interested to hear from all of you afterwards about wh where you'd be interested in this kind of work going. Um, but we think things that are interesting are support for stuff like HTTP2 for performance, WebSockets is interesting, we think security is interesting, HTTPS, TLS support, um, and then kind of building out the cloud capabilities. So how, once this is in the cloud, how do you monitor it? How do you cluster it? How do you, how do you see how it's performing? How do you debug it? all those kind of features as well, which are going to have to come over time. As for Swift on Linux, um, there's a big job ahead to complete the implementation of Foundation. So as I said earlier, on, on Darwin, on Mac platforms, you've got Foundation, which is the same Foundation it's always been, written in Objective-C. Um, on Linux, we're still completing Foundation, written in, in native Swift. Um, a lot of the big a lot of the big classes are there. NSURL session has recently been merged, which is going to be there for Swift 3. Um, but it's not complete, so there's work to be done on that. Um, we need to improve lib dispatch performance, scalability, lots more work to do on that, especially for the server side where it's so important. Um, and just seeing where this server side community goes, really, it's, it's been amazing how quickly all these web frameworks have exploded, um, how many people are interested in trying this out. Um, so, kind of, we're looking to the future. And it only looks bright, really, especially post Swift 3 when the compiler stops breaking every week and we can add features. <laughs> um, if you're interested in more about what we're doing at IBM, we've got a blog and a, uh, which you can go and have a read of, um, or you can just hit the team up on Twitter or GitHub or wherever. Um, delighted to talk to you about the future of Swift, future of Swift on Linux, and how we can make Swift really awesome in the cloud. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. All right. Questions? We have somebody running around with a mic. Uh, yeah, I have a question about following the open source Swift uh, repo. Uh, like you said, there's a Swift evolution mailing list, which is. 5,000 emails every second. Uh, <laughs> there's a Swift users mailing list. There's a Swift dev mailing list. There's yeah. It's it's like I'm trying to follow because I eventually I wanted to start contributing code to the repo, but it's it's a bit overwhelming. Uh, yeah. It's very hard to keep track of you. Um, so, so do you have any tips and tricks of how to what to focus on or anything like that? So I think. One of the things I would say is what I'd say to anyone interested in contributing to any open source project, which is scratch your own itch. So find whatever the problem with Swift is that you need to want to fix. Something that you think, why does it work like that? Or a performance problem that you trip over or a bug that you find. And, and then 
that's, that's always a better way to go into these things rather than turning up and looking at six million lines of source code and going, well, where do I start, right? <laughs> um, in terms of mailing lists, Swift Evolution is a bit of a fire hose, as I said. And to be honest, personally, I think sometimes there's a lot more noise than signal on that mailing list. Um, f a lot of the developers hang out on Swift Dev, so that's kind of more day-to-day. -day. Why is the build broken? Why is the build not broken? Um, for foundation, there's a separate mailing list. So if you're interested in, in helping out with actually filling out some of the missing bits of foundation, that'd be a great list to join. Um, it's also, there's, there's some uh, kind of newsletters which come out. There's a, few, there's a guy on um, GitHub who publishes a weekly kind of this week in Swift development newsletter, which is worth reading once a week. Um, and actually, recently, someone started up a, a server-side server Swift newsletter as well, which um, I can find the links for these if people are interested afterwards. Um, those are a bit more curated, obviously. Um, uh, yeah, just to follow up, I also saw that Apple had the, the Jira page yep. open, and the, there's bugs and small mm -hmm. tasks. Do you think it's easier to start with a bug or start with like, implementing something yeah. in the foundation? So bugs.swift.org um, is, is actively managed by Apple, so it's... Um, I think everyone's filed radars and wondered what happened to them, right? <laughs> you can see on bugs.swift.org what's happened to them. Um, and Apple have actually been pretty good at tagging some of these bugs in there as starter bug. Yeah. If, they th if they think that the bug is more kind of tractable by someone who doesn't know every nuance of the compiler, um, then th those could be a great place to start as well. Um, but, but I think gen in general, my advice is always to start with fixing your own, your own problem. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Otherwise, I do have questions. Go ahead. Um, all right. Let's think about your questions. Um, my number one is, um, um, and, and bear with me if you mentioned it already, running a <laughs> conference is, is actually I'm probably not the best guy in the audience following all the talks. Um, but uh, we spoke a lot about APIs and, and server side, but there is another part of this, the web development world, which is like the front end. And one thing that come up to my mind is templating. Mm -hmm. And there is like in the Ruby world, there is our ERB and Hamel and stuff like that. Is there something where you guys are trying to look into providing this part of the world? Yeah, so templating is, is a feature which is supported in Kitora. At the moment we support uh, a moustache based templating language. Um, That's great. We used to support another one, um, but the, the, the implementation of it kind of didn't keep up with the migrations up. I think once Swift 3 comes out and people, people have confidence that the, the language is stable, there's going to be a whole explosion of new packages landing on GitHub, and I, I bet templating is going to come up then. Um, and we'll be certainly in Kitora interested in supporting new templating languages which the community is interested in. It's a great answer because I was thinking about Mustache actually, mm. uh, which is one of the templating technologies. Um, the other one I have is um, is you guys are at the center of um, hearing about uh, uh, server side Swift. Do you hear like from uh, uh, people that are looking into the possibility of like changing their Java shop to a Swift shop? Um, so we're talking to IBM customers about this, obviously, especially IBM customers who have uh, big mobile deployments already. Um, IBM has a, a, a big product called the IBM Mobile First Platform, which is a Java-based backend uh, providing mobile capabilities like push notifications, all that kind of stuff. Um, this kind of transition to a Swift-based backend is not going to happen overnight because these, these existing well-supported, trusted, bulletproof backend technologies are, are are not going away, and people are people are still going to be running Java backends in 30 years. No joke, they are. Um, but for, for the, the new couple, <laughs> <laughs> but for, for for people who are building from scratch, um, I think Swift is going to start to become an option. Um, the the release of Swift three when the GA of that happens is, is a key moment because it, from, from that point onwards, Apple has stated that their goal is that the language should be source compatible as much as possible. Um, 
We'll see what that turns out like. I'm fact, sure there's th there's so many people at Apple that are like, oh, actually, yeah. Um, yeah. no, maybe not. But but language st language stability is important for people to be able to build infrastructure on top of it. We haven't spoken today about messaging at all. We haven't spoken <laughs> about a, a whole bunch of other stuff which it, people rely on on the back end. Um, so it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, it's going to be a many year thing. But and, and that's why this is this is what that's why I said this is fun, right? Because it's we're 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 starting on a green field here. Really. Any other question? This particular theme, by the way, stability is going to be a big part of the, the panel. Um, so the panel is going to be like in about 15 minutes. Uh, we announced that we're going to live stream it. So um, retweet our last tweet. Go ahead, be crazy so that we have one million uh, Java developers following the panel. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, now get go ahead, the, the last break before the panel. We'll be back here with 10 speakers uh, and uh, yeah, a bunch of microphones and amazing setup. Thank you, Aya, for introducing, for starting with the Swift server talk because tomorrow we have another one from Jens. Um, so um, thank you for having all, all those like two, three uh, s server side <laughs> colleagues at, at 7P joining the conference, which is something I, had, I wouldn't have think about a couple of years ago. Cool, thanks everyone. All right. <laughs>